Joseph was telling me, he's like, when you can achieve it and you have multiple perspectives and positions, power, supervisor, manager, whatever, he's like, you will also be getting multiple per, uh, multiple points of views. He's like, if you want to really think about it, you get multiple little caches of data that you can track. And I'm like, I told him like, yeah, I'm a very logical person. I just tell you like, hey, you know, the warehouse workers are really like, the morale doesn't exist anymore. We need to do something about it. And he's like, but if someone was more focused on making him happy, would never tell him that. I'm like, then I want the other guy. He's like, there you go, diversity. I'm like, oh, he's like, it's also mine. He's like, this is the part people don't catch. The way you think is also diversity. Everyone and welcome to the uh, new episode of the Business Blind Spots Exposed podcast. I'll call it Blind Spots because that's a lot shorter. So I want to tell you real quick what this podcast is all about first. So for those listening in for the first time and those who've been here for a number of times, uh, I'd love for you to understand what we ex- what you should expect to get out of this. For me, the greatest leaders are the ones who are always looking for the narratives, the stories that are emerging in the organization. And then once they understand it, they can start to control it. I call it the fairy tale ending. They can shape their story to get the fairy tale ending. I bring people onto this podcast so that they can start to see some of these narratives, these stories that others have seen, that others have heard. So they can start to say, "Uh aha, that's actually happening for me as well. So you can control your own ending. This is interactive. This is live. So we're publishing on Facebook, YouTube, and LinkedIn Live. So if anybody's listening in, feel uh, feel free to ask comments throughout the course of this. I've got uh, Josh online with me. Hey, Josh, how you doing? <laughs> hey, how are you doing? I'm doing really well. Good. So throughout the course of this, if you're listening in, please feel free to comment. Ask questions of Josh or I. Uh, I will tell you it makes the conversation even more interesting. Don't hesitate. In the meanwhile, if you are listening in, please tell us where you're where you're connecting in from. I'd love to. I'd love to see. I'd love to see it too, so please be sure to hit it up, because I got this cool little bar, I can see everything. <laughs> that's, that's right. We, uh, we see that, and we will change kind of the way we uh, talk with you and the, the questions that we answer throughout the courses. So make sure uh, you, you keep it interactive and answering questions for you. But today, I got Josh, Josh Bolton, and the topic of our podcast is developing and trusting your own leadership awareness. Josh, would you agree that there's a, a lot of talk, a lot of conversations, a lot of side stream conversations about awareness and people who are quote unquote woke these days. Have you been starting to hear a lot more about yourself? Yes and no. Um, Yes. And that some of the social justice calls are needed, but um, no, in that it's not in the toxic woke way, like the Twitter mobs, at least that's what I'm saying. Yeah, so let me tell you a little bit about Josh real quick, uh, just so you kind of see uh, who I've who I've invited to the show and why I'm so excited. So Josh actually runs a podcast. That's actually how I found out about him, called The Josh Bolton Show, uh, where he talks about mindset, motivation, and the philosophy of businesses, from everything from the small companies all the way up to the large corporations. Uh, the, uh, as he calls it, trials and tribulations of being, uh, of being an entrepreneur being the CEO of these companies and the tricks and tips for those future events that are coming, uh, coming, coming at you and how to be prepared for that. Uh, and, and what I love about Josh is really just kind of in this podcast, he kind of starts to go deeper into the details. You know, one of the things I loved in his bio, he, in his about section, he says his grandfather told him to always ask the question, whether you're going to be, whether it's going to be a good answer or a bad one. Ask the question that nobody else wants to ask because that's probably really the question that needs to be asked. <laughs> it does. Uh, I, I I really like that, and uh, I aspire to be the same way. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Josh, did I do a fair job of kind of painting a picture of who you are and kind of what makes uh, Josh Bolton tick? <laughs> Not tick. I'm a pretty easygoing guy. Um, but, yeah, that, that's exactly how it works. Yeah. So tell me a little more. Let's let's start off first with your podcast. I mean, you've been doing this for some time. You've had some really interesting people on there. Uh, why did you start the podcast? And, and what what are sort of the message that you're starting to come out throughout the course of it? So 
I actually wanted to start this like four years ago, but I was super scared of the Twitter mobs. I'm like, oh, they're going to take my job away and they're going to tweet and it's done. Now I realize I'm like, oh, wait, that's free press. Like, please tweet, tweet. It let me <laughs> kind of thing. Make sure you say my name correctly. <laughs> but um, yeah, that was the only reason. I just, I love talking to people. Even though I'm a super introverted person, I love talking to people. It's like that weird paradox. Um, and I mean, even as a kid, with, uh, with my grandfather, the um, he was he was an army vet. Uh, he never actually went in the field, but he did track and field for the army. I guess there's still a, a position for that for the soldiers. But um, he pretty much, w as he's raising me, we would camp, we would hike, we would. As a young kid, he gave me, he properly taught me because I was a brute even as a young kid, and taught me how to properly chop wood. And it's just one of those I've always at a young age had a good work ethic i didn't realize he was trying to he was thinking blue collar but it was really he was teaching the the beginnings of an entrepreneurship uh he started me on a mowing business and it was just more like he didn't want to mow he was getting too old so he's like 20 bucks a week can you just mow my lawn kind of thing he's like i'll have the mower you the gas etc you just you mow and, and it, that's when it hit me i'm like well if i get the neighbor whose lawn's shaggy i can get another 20 bucks a week and if i get that person and it just got it was growing but california the heat being insane here certain point I just called all my clients and said here's a good guy i, I can't do this heat anymore <laughs> <laughs> well i uh, there's a couple of things i want to unpack in there and and anybody who's listening in I'd, I'd love to hear if if there was someone in your life it sounds like yeah josh your grandfather it mm -hmm. kind of really is a foundation for a lot of your own growth from a, from an early age. Uh, anybody who's listening in, was there somebody who kind of started you on this journey or someone who may not have been at the very beginning, may have been somewhere along the way, a boss, a friend, a mentor, a colleague, a relative, who kind of started in your journey? I'd, I'd love to hear uh, who that was and who uh, how what they did for you. But I, I, the first thing I, I heard out of this was the introvert uh, that loves people. I, I took a Myers-Briggs type indicator test a number of times, and it actually tells me that I am an extrovert, but I'm the closest thing to an introvert that an extrovert can be. Uh, and people laugh at me all the time because I'm always making jokes, laughing with people. And what I found is that an introvert, the difference between an extrovert, at least when I did a deeper dive into what that means, is an extrovert is somebody who draws energy from others' thoughts. An introvert is one who drives and draws energy from their own thoughts. Yeah. The and the point being is that um, while I'm an extrovert, I got to have my time to myself where I sit down and just am able to process. And lots of times I find myself binge watching. It's I, I don't even really remember what I'm watching. It's just right. about two o'clock in the morning. I'm just going through all the thoughts of the day and kind of connecting the dots. And I, I don't think that fast. So it takes a little while sometimes, yeah. um, but eventually it comes together. So uh, the fact that you said uh, you love people, but you're an introvert, I, I'm constantly learning from others. So the fact that you do a podcast actually completely resonates with me. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah. And by the way, your show is absolutely brilliant. I was listening to at least six of your episodes, and it was just one of those. Some of them like, wow, like your, your story telling the kids of going up the mountain. I was like, <laughs> whether you're complaining or not, you're going up the mountain kind of thing. Might as well enjoy it. Yeah, you know, uh, that's uh, interesting you bring that one up. I, I find so many people, you know, as a personal passion of mine is just this idea that when I, I always love to learn from others, just kind of like you, mm -hmm. and so many people talk about this, gosh, my life is a slog, it, it sucks, yada, yada, yada. I say, well, you spend most of your life working and with people who are not part of your family, uh, why, would you, why, why would you allow yourself to hate it? And the, the point is that it's a choice. You can smile or you can you can frown, but it's the same slog either way, right? Either way. So so tell me more about you and this podcast. I mean, you've had some interesting guests. You've had some interesting insights. Uh, I've listened to a number of yours as well. What, what are the things that have, um, what are the first, tell me a couple of things that uh, came up for you in, in terms of running companies, uh, leading companies. What are the things that have stood out in your mind that you've come away with as core messages? The biggest one is it's something I've always noticed, but I couldn't put it into proper words is the, the old school 1930s factory line where it's like you are a gear to 
You are not allowed to have an opinion. You do what we say. But now that we have technology that can alleviate the mundane, we more we are now in more of a creative state. The old dogma of keep your head down, grind, do what you're told is actually kind of going out of fashion. And if you keep this mindset up, it's actually going to destroy your business. Wow. So that's really interesting because just yesterday I had a conversation with a lady named Barbara and she has been coming into companies for 40 some odd years now, just helping them organize and declutter and declutter is not about getting stuff off the floor and the shelves and stuff. It's really how do you access information within your company? Right. And she said, uh, since she's been doing it for some time, she talked about this idea that it used to be that executives and companies tended to have executive assistants who used to take stuff off of their plate and get those little things done because there's five minutes here, 10 minutes there, 15 minutes there. Mm -hmm. But with the onset of computers, uh, oh, we don't need that person anymore. That's a role we don't need anymore. We'll just, get, you know, the computer will do it. But uh, because of the automation, there's more time to think. And I'm kind of curious if you see an intersection between what that sort of that dynamic there and this idea that we've got this more creative capability. Do you see an intersection between those two things? Do you think they influence each other? Yes. No, they, they absolutely do. And and most of the people I've interviewed, um, actually, I just now realized the caliber of the person I interviewed afterwards, uh, Stefan, uh, he's part of a publicly traded uh, money management firm. And that was the biggest one he was, he was even talking about. It's like there's, especially with COVID, there are huge trends they're kicking in that would have normally taken five to eight years and i'm like yeah the whole everything online school is online i'm like school probably never would have gone online but because of covid it's introduced it now but i said yeah it's he even said it's a lot of the technology has alleviated burdens but it's also caused problems because now there are people unemployed kind of thing which he's like for the business that's good for society that's bad Wait, walk me through that one more time. You're saying that because things have moved online, for society is bad, but for business it's good. And that's just purely out of the fact that business is easier to transact business, but as a society, we don't get to talk to each other. Am, am, I, am I reading that right? Pretty much, yeah. Uh, because of the low over costs, I mean, to buy a Zoom, the hundred, it was like 120 bucks for me for the whole year. And you don't have to now pay your employees. They are now, well, okay, you have to pay their wage no matter what in their insurance. But, like, you don't have to, what things some employees don't realize is there's the insurance cost, the rent cost, the um, overhead utilities. It's like, if they're at home, they have to cover that themselves. Which, that right there saves the, so much money for businesses in general. But it's an unseen cost for the employee and, and public. That's interesting. I read a, uh, I, I want to say, I think it was a Goldman Sachs uh, report back in 2000. Uh, and they were putting out, a rep I think it was Goldman, Goldman Sachs, that they predicted what's going to happen over the next six, uh, 50 years. And they, that's when they, I think that might be where the idea of the gig economy was, was born. And they yeah. talked about this increasing shift to the financial burden to people. And I think that's exactly what you're saying here right that financial burden is it was something you know long time ago healthcare costs and pensions and all these and, and all that kind of stuff was borne by the company right and increasingly less and less of that is covered by companies and it's being pushed to someone else to figure that out for themselves which um i don't know is it, there, there's a good side and a bad side to that um, right there is and it, it, there's not really clear right answer either because like you, me and the the stefan were talking about for business, for the shareholders, this looks great. This is wonderful. But the morale of the employees is going down. The the, the finances, like, I think we, I mentioned it to him. I'm like, in general, the minimum wage has not been increased for, I think it was like 15, 20 years, which in theory with inflation, we're actually being paid less now than they, they were in the 70s kind of thing. Wow. Uh so this is interesting. Shifting the cost to the employees is 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 good on the on the on the balance sheet. Uh, right. it, it's good on the prospectus, but it is directly directly affecting the uh, 
I mean, the retention and loyalty of those employees because they just can't make make things work anymore. Right. So this is interesting because as a co- you know, my company, we focus on this idea of employee retention and productivity and engagement and loyalty. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's interesting because uh, what you're saying here is that as these things have been shifting to virtual, yeah, great. It looks good on the numbers, but that's, I mean, for every push, there is a, there's a pull, right? And that's, right. And that's where it's happening on the employee side. And I hadn't, and it's smart to make that connection until just now. So thank you for uh, <laughs> opening my <You're> eyes. <laughs> Pleasure to be assistance. Uh, wow, that's uh, that's uh, that's a that's a good connection there. I, I I so Josh, if you don't know it, I've already gotten four blind spots. That's number four right there. So really, uh, yeah, I'm 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 I'm, ge- I'm I'm learning stuff as as I'm talking to you here. That's a wonderful. What uh, what else did you get? What are the other messages that you've seen about? Uh, companies and, and what they've done, what they've learned, what you've learned. So actually, I just had a guest on, um, I believe he's John. I'm, oh, no, Joseph. Joseph, uh, I, I can't pronounce his last name. I'm not going to try. We were talking about AI, mm-hmm. same tie-in, and diversity. And it was one of those, at a certain point as we're talking, he's talking about BLM, Asian communities, women's rights, this and that. And I'm like, that's great. They're all good buzzwords. They're all important things. But I'm like, what about the blind, the deaf, the autistic? If we're going for true diversity, what about that group? They're not subjected. They're not their own compartment. That affects all communities, all walks of life. It's like, are we just going to ignore them kind of thing? And he's like, you're the only one that saw that. I'm like, if we're saying that we need to be diverse, great. Now, how do you incorporate that group? Uh. Yeah, really interesting topic for me here. Uh, so part of what I do in my company is start to show them where their blind spots are. And if we start to see through the data that they their employees in a particular role, for example, continue to fail in the same way, well, then we've just identified that there's no diversity and it's hurting them, right? I can mm-hmm. put a financial metric on that. And the question that comes, I mean, for me personally, or at least what I'm doing in my company uh, I'm bringing a lot more women into the company just because, guess what? A bunch of guys think of a very similar way. <laughs> oh, yeah. That's, right? So by having women uh, kind of saying, uh, let's pump the brakes for a second, Vinay, you're, you're being a guy again, right? Uh, that, that is my strength. That's also my fault. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Which, which you bring up a good point. That's only just one layer of diversity, right? I mean, uh Look, being from uh, of an Indian origin, Asian Indian origin, uh, I'm going to bring some diversity and difference in my perspective compared to someone else uh, who was uh, born and brought up in the United States, for example. Right? There's just right. a difference of culture, religion, food, all that kind of stuff. But I, but I might push. How how would you actually see that that makes a difference? Was did uh, did he offer any? kind of ideas or do you have any theories on how that actually changes things? No, this is exactly why I brought it up. Cause he said, this is the biggest blind spot that all businesses face. He's like, if you have a, a man of color, be like black, Latino, Mexican, Asian, he's like, whatever you, he's like, if you could afford it, get all of them, then get the female version. And then he's like, then you literally have all angles covered. There are no blind spots. He's like, there is, there are people going, he's like, yes, there might be more quarreling amongst each other, but he's like, it's, it's a healthy core, like arguing amongst each other because they're wanting change. They're wanting betterment for the company. And he's like, you will hear so many perspectives that you almost can't miss anymore. If you do, it's more likely just the one swinging. And this, what this really requires is that someone really level up their game. I mean, uh, you know, I will tell you for the longest time, I'm the biggest offender of this is if I, there was a saying that goes or quote says, if you want to go fast, go by yourself. If you want to go long, go with others. And that's exactly Uh, what he was saying too. Yeah. This is, this is going to force you to change your mindset, right? Your belief system. Because if you're, those blind spots are going to come to bite you in the ass. That's, that's a fact. It's just a matter of time. But if you've got diversity, the less chance that, that bl- a bl- you'll have a blind spot that's going to come and bite you. 
right? So mm -hmm. the less of a diversity blind spot you have, the less of a blind spot you have as a company, right? Right. Yeah, he was he was also mentioning, he's like, statistically, he's like, let's use banks because stereotypically most people work at the banks are white. So he's like, we don't, well, there's not going to be any arguments with that. He's like, how many people of color are actually brilliant mathematicians, but they can't get in because it's stereotypically it's a white person? Mm -hmm. And I'm like, tons. I know a lot of people of color are genius in math. I suck. can barely do visual math. Like two plus two, only through repetition I know it's four. Kind of thing. Mm -hmm. And that's where he's like, imagine instead of paying the $200,000 for the white guy, same guy, $100,000, not because he's black, Asian, or whatever. He's like, because it's new blood in the system. You like they all, everyone knows when you're new blood, your price lowers. He's like, imagine same quality or even better for less price, but you had to go beyond your comfort zone. And I'm like, why don't people do that at all? And I'm like, that actually makes so much sense. Get as much new blood in as possible. I mean, obviously, you got to keep your, like, the old guards, certain things you have to keep. But, yeah, just, and he said, it's a comfort. It's a thing in the human psychology that we want people like ourselves. If he's like, but if you start off already a rainbow, well, then you'll just be like, maybe we need a little more citrus kind of thing. Hmm. Yeah, I've I've often thought for a long time diversity is actually a superpower, not a not a checkbox. Right? It's not something you've got to say. Yeah. This is interesting. Uh, I, you, there's a uh, service uh, and virtual assistant service that I've been using for probably the better part of eight, eight, nine years now. Uh, mm -hmm. And I will likely never meet the people that I've met through that. But there have been some of the hardest workers, most dedicated, most loyal people that I've ever worked with. And mm -hmm. I've met them completely online. Um, and the beautiful thing is, yeah, sure, I pay uh, a, a lot less. That's 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 for sure. Um but so that there's a real benefit there, but they also just see the world in a completely different perspective. I have one uh, team member who, uh, who actually runs all my podcasts for me. She, uh, awesome. what's that? She's freaking awesome. Oh, she's, she's, she, Janine is, is, is fabulous. I will, I oh, yeah. will agree. And she is just one example of, of a number of people that I have that I, I think are fabulous on my team. Uh, I just remember the other day she came to me and said, hey, I, I've got this idea of, and I, we're, we're going to start having more projects here. I think we need to implement a project management system. And I and I'm, I hear this from her and I go, well, hold on a second. She's probably half, She, I don't know if she's even half my age, actually. She's much younger than me. And I just had a conversation about how we need to have a project management system uh, to start scaling our company. And she is already thinking like that. I was like, first of all, half my age, she is never going to meet me, but she's already think she's already ahead of me in, in the way she thinks. Mm -hmm. Gosh, how how uh, how smart did I feel that day for hiring her? Right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. So. When you go to her check, it's like an extra hundred bucks. Like that was brilliant. Here, get, get this stuff done. Yeah, she uh, she and a, and, a, and a number of others in the company are always pulling me forward, which is which is which is fabulous. Um. So what do you, what do you think? Uh, this I mean, there's a lot of buzz around this uh, diversity and uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion. What do you? Uh, I mean, there, there is it a lot of chaff or is there a, a lot of wheat to it? Does that make sense? Right. It, it's like the question when we first started the the woke society. There, this is some of the. It's you have to do it now. If you don't do this in five to ten years, your business will die. Like it, it there is no saving it you have to do this now yes there's the good cause of we're getting other people involved but um like he was telling me he's like um his statistics he helps with a, a like a hospital he said he talked to a like a re the not the ceo but like the president or something maybe like the district the overseer manager and he essentially said she realized real quick most of their nurses are of the latino and black community hmm. and he's i'm like i thought it was the philippines he's like M -m this one specifically was black and latino but yeah mostly f black latino from philippines in general and he's like but they were hiring the wrong type so she realized real quick cancel that and they only hire that group now hmm. because because they are the hardest working they they have they want to go from wherever up and they know by being a nurse or a doctor they can achieve their goal of leaving the race, the rat race kind of thing. 
This is interesting. Um, I just actually, uh, I, I was talking to someone else who I'd, I'm going to be bringing on to my podcast. I just, just before you and I started talking, uh, he's been in the pest control industry, which is the industry that I, our company is, is so heavily focused on right now. And he's been in the industry for some time. And, and I put out the statement that I love using and I still, because I think it just works over and over again. That is, I can pay people for their minds, but if I get their hearts, I win. And Absolutely. I think that's, 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 that's what I'm hearing from you here, right? Is, is your, this, this lady who runs this hospital started to realize, let me get the people who've got their heart uh, that uh, doing this role gets them to where they want to go, which gets me where I want to go. Both parties win. Is it, did I hear 100%. that right? hundred percent. So DE, DEI, diversity, equity, and inclusion is about a superpower, uh, is about unlocking a superpower, not, right. uh, not, 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 a, not just something you, you ought to think about. Exactly. And the, the thing the, the guest was talking, Joseph was telling me, he's like, when you can achieve it and you have multiple perspectives and positions, power, supervisor, manager, whatever, he's like, you will also be getting multiple per, uh, multiple points of views. He's like, if you want to really think about it, you get multiple little caches of data that you can track. And then I'm like, I told him like, yeah, I'm a very logical person. I just tell you like, hey, you know, the warehouse workers are really like, the morale doesn't exist anymore. We need to do something about it. And he's like, but if someone was more focused on making him happy, would never tell him that. I'm like, then I want the other guy. He's like, there you go, diversity. I'm like, oh, he's like, it's also mine. He's like, this is the part people don't catch. The way you think is also diversity. Yeah. And by bringing people from different backgrounds, you are kind of hedging your bets by bringing different types of thinking. Yeah. It becomes kind of the law of large numbers. Big enough, it doesn't really, you, you just see it all happening. You're like, perfect, fix this section. So uh, l let's just assume for a moment. I, I, I think the law of large numbers, everyone gets kind of gets the phrase, has heard the phrase. Tell me more about how you think about the law of large numbers and kind of how that applies here or wh why you think it applies here. Well, if we're going it from the perspective and data like you would, is the more data or the more numbers you can get, the more you can distill and simplify it. If you have a very itty-bitty small pool, let's say like only 10 employees out of the 1,000, well, that's – they could be intentionally brown-nosing. Then they'll never tell you anything that's wrong. But if you get everyone, there's going to be a lot of people that are just going to be like, well, I'll just use myself as – Josh is an asshole as a manager. Like he gets shit done, but it's like he doesn't like focus on us. He doesn't help us kind of thing. Well, if you had that little pool of 10, you'll never see that kind of yeah. thing. So it's like if you – even if it's a simple survey, an anonymous, you just be like free for all. If you want to cuss me out, go for it kind of thing. But tell me exactly what's happening. That right there, that much data, that's a lot. Then you can realize, oh, wow, I didn't realize for pest control. Let's say Johnny, he goes to this one client, but they talk his ear off. He wants to keep working, but he also wants customer service. Kind of thing. So if it's like the, if we can get him assistant to literally just alleviate him from the problem, then we can get a lot more done. But if it's, that's just one point of view, you'll never see it. Yeah, yeah. I, th I think that's a really important thing too, right? I mean, how broad is your your understanding of perspectives, right? If you look at one perspective, you you can only see this much, right? But if you open up your perspective, you see a whole, whole heck of a lot, whole heck of a lot more, and you're much more informed in terms of how to make uh, make a good, solid decision, right? So, I mean, we we built this podcast, or we kind of named this uh, the topic of this podcast, this idea of owning your leadership awareness, and I think we've talked about a couple of things here, right? Uh, about this idea of uh, you are a gear in the system is sort of this old thinking. You got to shift that mindset, and being aware of that as a leader is 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 one of the one of the things that I've written down here. Right, mm -hmm. um, this idea that uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion is is a superpower to be unlocked is another one. What are what are the other things that you think uh, uh, an aware leader should be aware of? It's actually kind of touching on to that. It's something you do, as we've talked before, is you just hire smart people and let them do their thing. If this building's on fire, then obviously call me. We could have to put that problem out kind of thing. But you be you, 
just go for it. And that's actually the most, that's the biggest thing I'm seeing is when you can get people, because I'm listening to the book, um, What Is Your Why by Simon Sinek. Mm-hmm. And I realized that is, it's just any company now. You got to have that, but you also have to have multiple people. And it's the hardest part as a leader is you have to just put your hands up politely and be like, all right, just send me some reports if something's going wrong kind of thing. And just. So do you have any insights or uh, thoughts from what you've heard or what you, what you've thought in terms of how do you get those, excuse me, get those right people? Cause you got to get the right people on, on the bus, right? And you go in the right direction. hundred percent. What, um, what, what do you, what do you think? Well, it depends. Um, if you're you're beginning it like if someone's starting right now a new batch, um, and you're applying for the like job boards like LinkedIn, Monster, etc., be very specific on what you're looking for. Because if you say, "Oh, we want a motivated um, hustler willing to work extra hours," that's anyone that has a pulse kind of thing. You want specifically, shit can get hard. Well, you wouldn't say that on a thing, but it's like stuff can get hard. We might ask you to work a little longer. Um, it's a little rough for a new startup, but once you get established, like you, there's truly room to grow. Well, I would he read that, I'd be like done, kind of thing, because I want to grow in a business. I don't want to be stuck scrubbing toilets, kind of thing. Yeah, uh, I actually just put a you know I told you about that vir- uh, that virtual assistant service that I use. I'm mm-hmm. used it to everything from uh, developers, code developers to, uh, virtual assist. I mean, uh, executive assistants to mm-hmm. podcast managers, right? So I've used it for a lot of different things, video editors, so on and so forth. And most recently, it's probably been three weeks ago now that I put out a post called the world's best executive assistant, assistant comma ever. <laughs> right. Uh, right. and usually I get about four or five people that will respond to posts. This one, I got 78. And I was trying to understand, well, first of all, I'd love for people, you know, droves of people to come out. And I, so I started asking everyone, so why did you respond to this post? And one of the things I led with is uh, my core values. And, and I asked them which ones matter to them and why. Uh, I also said, look, I don't want a copy of me because I, I, another good word I learned instead of cultural fit, um, uh, I'm looking for cultural ad. I'm looking for somebody who's going to, amplify my capabilities not just do me right uh, and i will show you everything that i know to get you there because you're just making me better and it seems right. so incredibly transparent and honest but that's what everyone responded saying uh yeah i, I that that's exactly why i responded and i think that's kind of what i'm hearing here right just lean into the role and say look i i want to help you become good because i get good because of it is that does that sound fair Pretty much. And what you did on your post is what I read just now in the book was you let off your why, your core values of your company, what you're going for. And that's the biggest thing Simon says. He's like, you doesn't matter if it's could be an air quote terrible job. As long as you leave with the why and they align with it, they don't care. Because they feel now they are more invested than you and they will put in the extra time, the work off the clock kind of thing. Yeah, you know, it's uh, it's funny in the conversations I have with everyone. Um, I I am I feel like this is the taboo com- conversation that is that was that you're not supposed to have, but I I've just started to have it. And that is when people come on board to the company, I say, look, if I'm really successful in this role, you absolutely love what you do, and I get out of the way and I fold my fingers behind my head and I I lean back in my chair with my feet up on my desk. If I'm doing a really good job, I don't have to do any work <laughs> because you love what you do. And I feel like that's, you're not supposed to say that. <laughs> no, that's actually, people love that. And uh, Ravi, yes, I 100% agree with your uh, comment. Oh, Ravi. Yeah, yeah, Ravi. I didn't, uh, I didn't, uh, I didn't see that. Ravi, thanks for, hey, thanks for chiming in. Ravi's a fabulous, fabulous guy. He's a, he does, he does a lot of coaching for executives. So he gets this. Yes, he uh, does. Yeah. Uh, look, I, I don't, I, you know, I told my kids one plus one is, is not always equal to two. Sometimes one plus one equals 50. And I'm looking for the people who are the other one that make me 50. <laughs> oh, hundred percent. Yeah. Uh, we, we go faster together. So hire smart people and you will go in the right direction, but be specific in what your posts are. Uh, be specific in what, what help you need is, is kind of what I, what I heard from you. Right. 
hundred percent. And like one of my guests, I actually laughed at it, and then, but it was brilliant. He said he had this whole list, perfect, explaining his why, the what, and how. But it, like halfway in the middle, he wrote because he was wanting a, a, a person that's very um that can follow the rules. Because he's like, I hired a bunch of rebels. That's fine. He's like, I don't need them anymore. He's like, well, I do, but I don't. He's like, I specifically wrote, don't bring me your resume. Bring me a printed picture of your favorite cat. <laughs> I don't like, wait, what? He's like, yeah, like 20 showed up with the resume. He's like, only two showed up with a picture of a cat. I was only hiring one, so I hired both of them instead. Yeah, that's uh, that's funny. Uh, I one of the things that I always do in my posts is I say which one of the core values resonate most with you and and why, right? Mm-hmm. Open ended question, uh, and I will tell you, eighty percent of people just respond with, uh, you know, here's my resume, here's my background, and I look, there's no response to that question. That's an easy peasy one to just kind of like, right. I don't want that one. <laughs> yeah, it's like filter out. I'm done. No. <laughs> yeah, that you, you just made it easy for me. So be specific. Be be specific in what help you need and and how they fit into the. Uh, I think I heard how they fit into the organization as well, right? Right. What else? Uh, I'm Josh. Josh Bolton is dropping lots of knowledge on me, and I'm getting all these nugget, nuggets down. So I'm processing as fast as I can in writing. Get, drops more knowledge on me. What are what are right. the other things you're learning? Other things I'm learning. Um, it's more the the overarching trend. So you, you're everyone says it, but they don't fully define it. It's like your your company has to have a mission, but a purpose too. So one of the biggest things the guests told me is like, if you're going to say like Tom's, like everyone knows Tom's, you buy a pair of shoes, yes, they're expensive, but they give a pair of shoes to someone. He's like same with Bombas, buy a pair, yes, it's expensive, but you're paying for the second pair. And people. That's what they want. They're like, okay, I don't want just a transaction anymore. I was like, yes, it's nice. I can buy it for cheap, but how far much farther can my dollar go to help people? Kind of thing. And so it's like, I told them, like, okay, what if it's like you buy a bottle of water and after so many sales, like I actually go dig a well, hire a crew and dig a well for like someone. And he's like, 100%. And he's like, and because they know you're digging a well and it's not cheap. You can charge a little extra for that because there's a mission, there's a why, there's a cause for it. And I just sat there and I'm like, interesting. He's like, so whatever it is you do, he's like, obviously you're gonna have to like prove you do it. So like you're gonna have to show a video for those who are gonna want it. But he's like, that is the biggest rallying point people are wanting now. They don't like they're like, we all know Walmart and Amazon. Like we can get anything for cheap there, pretty much anything too. They're like, what can I do to help? my fellow humans. And he's like, that's now the new trend he sees coming. Hmm. Uh, I'm curious, Ravi, you, you worked with lots of leadership and large companies. I'm kind of curious if you're seeing this uh, trend as well from your, your point of view and, and any others who are listening in, I'd love to love to hear from you. Are you seeing this trend as well that companies have to have a mission, but also a purpose that people can buy into? Um, Josh, what, what I'm hearing as I, as I heard that from you, is I mean I think Apple is probably the most um, r- might be the most recognizable in doing this. Right. Uh, Apple is ultimately a computer company, but I don't think people kind of feel a little funny when you say that they're they're not a computer company. Yeah, yes, they are. <laughs> That's all they, they start- do. Well, they started as a computer company, but even Jobs realized at a certain point we'll be limited to market. We'll be like Dell, so we are a innovator of the industry, whatever right. the industry is. Yeah. They're, they're more an, emo- an, an emotion that you buy into. It's part of a club or country club that you become yeah. uh, a, a member of, not a piece of hardware. Exactly. Which is where some of the other other people, uh, uh, some of the other companies live from. And hey, look, there's a time and the space for it. But, th- you know, there was a book called uh, Blue Ocean Strategy um, a long time ago. I want to say it was in the early 90s, and it talked about how in a blue ocean, you're constantly innovating and you're leading the pack. In the red ocean, everyone there's chum in the water and everyone's you know fighting each other, which seems like Samsung and Nokia and Microsoft and LG and all those companies that are just constantly mm-hmm. roll and they're all fighting with each other. While meanwhile, Apple's continuing to press forward. Well, the the right. biggest one from Simon Sinek's why is they're doing they're treating their products like a commodity. So in treating it like a commodity, well, you're going to keep undercutting yourself 
to be the one with the higher, faster, but cheaper product. And that's where he's like, have you noticed the, in, well, this is me paraphrasing for him. Have you noticed Apple's price keeps going up kind of thing compared to yeah. the others are going down because they know what they're doing. They have a, they have a flag. They're standing behind it. Yeah. So that's a, that's an interesting thing because, uh, Look, having uh, grown up as a Microsoft engineer, as in having built lots of solutions and developed lots of solutions on Microsoft platforms, uh, used to always use PCs, and I couldn't understand why people loved Apple so much. Because honestly, it was a pain in the ass to use uh, it Microsoft still is. products on Apple. <laughs> right? Yeah, it, it still is. Yet people swear by them, and they'll pay four times as much for this computer with the same exact processor and RAM and everything else. Displays pretty much the same thing but they'll pay four times as more and we'll swear by it <laughs> yeah. and, and as soon as chromebooks came out uh windows market share kind of started to drop pretty significantly because they were just looking for a better cheaper solution so 100 so don't treat your product like a commodity is is what i get out of that uh, right and from our meeting before like when you were showing me your product and the charts, I could tell this was quality. This was not something I just pay like a thousand bucks for the year and just, if it's nice, I buy it again. This is something like I realized as a person watching, but also you just explaining, you're going to add more layers. You're going to add more this. So it's like the, oh, might as well be like a semi early adopter and then just get it locked in on a nice price. So later on, when everyone's wanting it and it's five times the price. I'm still locked in at a thousand kind of thing. Yeah, it's interesting you uh, say that. I mean, sort of our the the thought process that keeps going through my mind is that early adopter loyalty is value so valuable to me. Oh, it is. Uh, gosh, I mean, the problems that I'm going to continue to solve in the in the future, as in terms of employee retention and engagement, and trying to measure productivity and how how much is pushing your employees too hard, uh, solving those problems. Uh, getting your employees and people to love you. I'm going to solve those for problems for the people who are on board with us first. And I think that's part of, that's the opposite of treating it like a commodity, right? Yeah. Uh, it's where we're feeling their pain alongside of them. And I think well, there's you, real value there. Well, hundred percent. I would say, whether you realized it or not, you did exactly what we were just talking about, where you like, you realized the value. You're not looking for everyone like Apple. You're looking to bring, so much value to, to like the select group or whatever that intrinsically they'll all just talk to each other and be like, dude, if you don't have this, you're, you're like, you, you got to get them, get them while you can. Yeah. Well, that, that that's the goal. <laughs> if, they, <laughs> if, if they don't, if the light bulb hasn't gone off, please talk to someone else and hopefully the light bulb will go off. And if not, that's perfectly fine <laughs> as well. Right. Right. But the reason I bring it up again is the, the way you displayed it, the first thing I thought of wasn't just pest control, was warehouses. Mm-hmm. If you I'm say, are you looking into getting into warehouse stuff? There's actually a guy, um, I had a guy named Chuck that I talked to a couple weeks ago. He does warehouse management solutions. And he said, Vinay, I've got all the data behind this stuff. We can tell, they're, they're doing things where they help warehouses manage pallets and do partial right. pallets, right? Partial pallets of packing, which he said is where a lot of the errors and uh, challenges start to occur. And mm -hmm. he said, if there was a way you could start to tell me who are the employees that are the employees and the people, the workers, technicians, whatever the case may be, who are doing really good jobs and what are the behaviors that they exhibit that tend to be really effective? You could tease those out and teach everyone how to do that. So everyone gets to be the superhero that they're supposed to be. So, uh, yeah, the conversation, uh, I've, I've actually had a pretty deep conversation with him about that. Good. So, it's, it's, a, it's a very untapped market. I can say it that way because I used to work security for a warehouse company. Me being me, I love talking to everyone kind of thing. And the biggest one, one of the big executives, we'll call him like the district manager, he, this, this warehouse in particular I was working at was like his jumpstart, his baby that got him to where he is this big position now, making the 20K a month. Um, and by the way, he doesn't even look like he's making that much money. He just has a beaten up like ranger. He wears like a blue polo. I mean, you're like, you would assume he's just like some poor old guy left on the side of the road, but you don't realize he's making like a shit ton of money too. But so he came up to me one day and was like, Hey Josh, something's wrong with the warehouse. The numbers are down. 
And I'm like, okay. He said, well, you're a very observant guy. What's wrong? And I said, well, when you just pulled up and that guy that left, he's like, yeah. I'm like, he literally just said, I wish I got in a car crash and broke my legs so I didn't have to come to work. I'm like, morale does not exist here anymore. Just saying morale has more value than what exists here. Yeah. Wow. That's a really insightful story there, right? Uh, if that person's not wanting to come to work, uh, it is mounted to a fever, a fever pitch kind of, or, mm -hmm. or to a breaking point. What was the lead up to that? And the, I don't know, the 385 days that led up to that point where, or, right. or the through five years that led to that point where they say, I just don't got, give a flying flip anymore. And they that's exact. That's exactly what I told him. Like, you make a lot of money because me and him have talked before. And I'm, he's like, yeah. I'm like, would a hundred bucks a week really hurt you? Would it throw everything out of proportion? He's like, no. I'm like, to them, a hundred bucks is the world. Buy him a gift card or give him cash kind of thing. And I promise you within so much time, it's going to increase. And I said, but first one is just to see, test the water, chum it kind of thing. Second one, make a rule. All right, I'm going to up the ante. 300 bucks, three people. But you all have to make sure who, the top three kind of thing. And then I'm like, the week after that, I'm like, thousand bucks, but it's one of those. Or you could just buy him a taco guy, same thing, and you, you get food. By the end of it, he was giving away about 500. He wanted the top five because it was like 15 people. So he's like, I want to see, make sure a third of my boys are working correctly. The morale of that place went up so much. In one, one, maybe two months, it went from, let's say, like fake numbers, 100 shipments a day to 500 shipments a day. Hmm. And everyone's like, what happened? And now all the managers are calling my little area, my morale. Treat him like a human, not a robot. Interesting. Treat him like a human, not a robot. I'm going to quote Josh. <laughs> um, awesome captions. That's right. Uh, that's a that's a that's a that's a good story, and and you said it happened actually in relatively short order, and wasn't. I mean, sure, there's some dollars involved, but it wasn't a gigantic sum of money. It doesn't sound like it sounded for him because he he. I even told him like, what could you actually like lose right now that wouldn't hurt you? He's like five thousand. Like there you go, that is your fund for every month. I'm uh, capturing this. Treat them like a like humans, not a robot. I like it. <laughs> and it got to the point. Actually, people were eager to go in early. They were literally calling each other out for shit. So because they're like, "You're not gonna mess up my like, thousand bucks, man. Fuck you. I'm gonna <laughs> snitch on you." And That's funny. They're, they're starting to push each other. Yeah. Huh. And then when the taco guy came, literally, and it was just one of those where I was working was an onslaught. Like literally I had in one hour, like a hundred semi trucks in and out. And I had a balance between the two. Literally the guy, the, the district manager called my boss and said, get someone down here. Josh is eating the first taco because he fixed our warehouses. And they literally had to wait for like another 30 minutes to ensure I got the first batch. <laughs> wow. That sounds like a, uh, that sounds like an honor to have been at the front well, of that line. <laughs> it totally was. And it's funny. I was a total gringo and they're all speaking uh, Spanish. And I'm just like, eh, I don't know what you're saying. You could be cussing me out. I don't know what you're saying. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. Uh, so, I, I, you know, there's a term that I don't feel like I hear very much anymore. It was really popular. I want to say like five, seven years ago. And the idea is gamification. Uh, yes. I mean, that, that's basically what we're talking about here, right? Is you, 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 they built some gamification into the system and that changed the morale. It made it more enjoyable, got their head back in the game. Oh, 100%. And I did, and actually, now that you say that, I didn't even realize I was doing that. It's like, I was just thinking, what if my boss did something like that? And we're like, then hell yeah, I'd like crack and work as hard as I could. Cause it's like, I don't want to lose that, that bonus kind of thing. Yeah. So I just told him, like, that's what I would do. If you offered that price to me, I'd work really hard. Yeah. Um, yeah, so I'm on uh, uh, number 11. I've been getting lots wow. of... Wow. Yeah, so here, here's... Is that a record? Oh, uh, he is. He just but, held it up. 
th- th- thirteen is my record. We're 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 right. pretty uh, pretty close, and I've got ten, we've got ten minutes to go. So I'm sure we can squeeze out two oh, more. Hundred percent. Get get give me drop drop some more on me. <laughs> All right. Um, in what industry are you wanting, or perspective and trends? Uh, just one that kind of uh, give me one that surprised you that you just kind of didn't see coming. Uh, kind of was counterintuitive. How's that? Okay. Um, it actually was the first one I ever learned doing the show. I had two CEOs and at the time I was just like, Oh my God, CEO kind of thing. Like this is the pinnacle. Now I'm just like, Oh, okay. They're just like us. But, um, <laughs> essentially the biggest one is the, especially the, the accountant guy. He essentially said like, what people don't realize as a leader is kind of like this whole show you're you're enabling people you're winding them up you're letting them go but he's like i actually in my firm i make it a point to know everyone their personal things he's like so he's like there's a guy we'll call him jimmy for reasons i don't want to actually say his name i'm like i get it whoever this jimmy is he's like he's a bodybuilder i don't know anything about weightlifting or eating carbs to protein ratio to get your mass up he's like but he was so passionate. He's like, now I understand the basics and I realize I'm not living a healthy lifestyle. But he's like, in doing so, he's like, I learned his stuff. He's like, not, I never asked him to do this. He's actually gone off the clock to make sure a project's done. Because I made the time to learn who he is. So he went out of his way to make sure he helped me. And that, oh, sorry about that. Um, that is the biggest one I've learned is like, the tree of my human, not a robot. Learn them, understand them. They they have a name. They're not a number, kind of thing. So this is uh, this is cool. I've got a number of books that uh, um, I've 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 already kind of plotted them all out and which I'm going to write. I'm just uh, I'm I'm giving myself about an eighteen months to to get the uh, I started in the first one. And one of them I call it's building your own amplifiers. Mm-hmm. building your own personal army. And the idea is that uh, by leaning into others, uh, they it endears them to you. And I've you know, some of these people that I work with been working off the clock for me. And I was like, oh, no, 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 I, I, I appreciate that. Charge me for it. They said, I don't do it because I want to charge you. And I, I do it because I, I, I like doing it. Mm-hmm. I, gosh, I can't tell you how much that means. And I think I'm hearing the same thing here, right? That right. people don't realize that learning about others endears them to helping you in your goals, which is <laughs> that that's a that's a great story. <laughs> it is, and it, it's it's the like we were leading into earlier. It's the let them be them, and be the manager or in your case the business owner. You're just there to enable them. If they need a ten thousand dollars software, great. Can you just give me basic quirks of what it does. Oh, that's it. Great. Here. Put it on the credit company credit card kind of thing. Get your job done if you need that. As compared to others who are like, oh, that's out of budget. It's like, but if you're saying that you can recoup it and within six months, it's not really a problem kind of thing. So, uh, you know, an analogy or story that I tell people all the time when I hire them is this idea that if you use a football analogy, which is what I use here, Mm-hmm. There's two key players on a on a team. The one is the blocker, and one is the quarterback. I am not the quarterback. I am <laughs> the blocker. Right uh, now, I will tell you: if you're going to go left, my job is to create a pocket to the left for you. And if you go right, my job is to create a pocket to the right. But you got to tell me: if you go left, and you told me right, and I go right, <laughs> and you get your clock clean, I can't help. Right. But the point is, I'm supposed to give you the space to play, not you give me the space to play. Uh, but I look fabulous as a blocker. If every time you throw the throw the ball, you've got this gigantic pocket from within which to operate, right? So, right. I think that's what I'm hearing here: is a, a leader is more the blocker than they are the uh, the star player of the game. 100 percent. And that's that was the biggest one I've learned and realized. I'm like, wow. Everyone thinks, oh, they just sit there and crack their whips and as a CEO and get their stock options. Like, no. No, they, they're doing a lot of back work that people don't realize they're doing. Yeah, someone told me that uh, being the CEO is the loneliest job you'll ever have. And the reason why is because you can never share everything with anyone, right? Because uh, mm-hmm. there's always politics. I mean, even within my company and the, uh, you know, the dozen plus people that we have, um, 
you know, I, I can't, you know, I can't talk about politics because that's really not fair to anybody else because I see it from a different perspective. Right. Um, but what I do do is ask for a lot of perspectives of people because they see things from levels that I can't see, but it is, uh, it is a, uh, it is a challenge sometimes. It is a lonely place to be. <laughs> that is another one that the things uh, I didn't realize as an owner or even a CEO is pretty much everyone has told me, like, once you get high enough on the tree, there's really no one you can talk to. You are truly alone. They're like, that's why CEOs like talking to CEOs because they can at least talk about something and they understand. Yeah, I, I found an organization called uh, EO Entrepreneurs Organization. Okay. Uh, which is, I, I joined that about a year ago, and, and that is, uh, actually, uh, we've got a, my monthly uh, meeting with my cohort of other uh, owners of companies, and it's really just kind of a support group for them because they are not in your business. They're not going to touch your business. They're not in the competing business, but you can kind of tell them, oh, gosh, I got this employee that uh, I just don't know what to do with. How have you all dealt with it? And they give suggestions and feedback because ultimately the the, it, it rests on your shoulders to make the right decision, make the decision. Right. Um, but going back to the, what you were saying earlier about getting as many perspectives as you can, here's, you know, four or five people who say, here's how I might, might, might approach it. Or let me poke some holes in what you're, what you're thinking is there from my perspective. And you, uh, you harden your perspective very, very quickly, which is, which is a yeah. good thing. To do. The, the other thing I've always done it. I didn't realize it was a thing that people were scared to do is, as a leader, be vulnerable and be like, hey, I'm struggling with this. I'm not going to lie. It's kind of sucks. What do you <laughs> think we should do? And that is the biggest one everyone's told me. Like That is when literally people realize, oh, you are human, so we are going to help you kind of thing. He's like, the whole ego thing, he's like, that's what deters people. He's like, if you just be straight up, he's like, don't give too much detail. You obviously don't want to scare them all. But he's like, just say, hey, this is going on. A little bit of a problem. Not sure how to fix it. What would you guys do? He's like, that will fix 90% of your problems right there. The story that I'm, I'm going to share with you here. Okay. Um, I went to a conference recently, and, and when I was at that conference, they did a session on stress reduction. And uh, that's just kind of up my alley, just kind of internal uh, awareness as a leader for myself. And uh, they went around asking questions to get you out of your head and more sort of into your into your heart and into your feelings. And the the question that they asked um, of everyone, it was we we're sitting in a circle. There's probably thirty plus of us, and they asked the question, "What what brings you joy?" And some people talk about music and their children and stuff. And I gotta tell you, I was probably number twenty in line, and I could feel it. I could feel it coming up, um, and it got to me where I. I couldn't, I mean, everyone's kind of, you know, two or three, four seconds, they're kind of expressing what it is that they're thinking. I couldn't speak. And that's usually not a problem for me. <laughs> <laughs> I couldn't speak. I just couldn't get words out. And then eventually something comes out, but it just, uh, I, I don't even know that it was anywhere close to a, a real sound. It was just kind of like this guttural <laughs> noise, right? Yeah. Uh, and it took me, so I'm now 20 seconds in and I can't speak. And I'm, I've actually started to tear up quite a bit. I mean, it's, uh, and, and I finally get it out that it was my, uh, my youngest son that brings me a lot of joy just because of you know, the context of a situation around him. Mm -hmm. And I was like, gosh, I have a bunch of people in this room that I've never, never talked to who don't know who the heck I, I am. And they just saw me <laughs> kind of break down in front of them. I was like, oh boy, I'm, I'm never going to be invited back. And I can't tell you the number of people that came over to me and they're like, I'm so glad you were in the room with me. And I was like, huh, that's exactly the opposite of what I thought was going to happen. Uh, it was a little awkward at the moment. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but, uh, but 10 minutes later, I was like, huh, there was a reason for that. And it, uh, it just kind of endeared those people to me because they saw that not some person who sits up all, all high and mighty on my pedestal. I, uh, there's, uh, there's things that I feel as well. So, yeah, I, uh, I felt that point. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, Josh, uh, I'm, I'm putting this last one. So that was number 14. Heck yeah. The 
So I, 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 I got I got a lot out of this session. And uh, first, I want to kind of thank Ravi for chiming in and on all the others who may have been listening in. Thank you for uh, being and listening. Hopefully, there was a, a really you, you got something out of this. Uh, Josh, thank you. You definitely dropped a lot of uh, really good points that, you know, I have at some point in time thought of myself, uh, but may not have necessarily ever written down. So thanks for taking me through a tour of what you've learned. My pleasure. That's what I'm here to help. Wow, I can't uh, talk today. <laughs> I I, uh, I I appreciate it, Josh. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, just for anyone who was listening in, if you want to see the replay of this, uh, it is on LinkedIn, Facebook, and YouTube uh, as of right now. You can go in and find it. Or uh, LinkedIn, the next couple of weeks, you'll, you'll see some snippets and posts and little sound bites from here. And you'll also see it pushed out to Google Podcasts, Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, Deezer, and a couple of other places, platforms as well. So thank you all for, uh, for listening and taking some time to listen to uh, Josh give us, drop some knowledge on us. Thanks, Josh. Thank you.